Good morning to all who are following the Brains Team 2020 conference. My presentation today will focus on some practical aspects regarding the estimation of EG connectivity in real time. In particular, these aspects are related on the amount of data which is required to obtain reliable connectivity estimates. The work that I'm going to show in this presentation was carried out in the framework of the Connect to Brain project. This is a near synergy funded project whose aim is to develop new technology for multi locus TMS combined to real time EG for in a closed loop system for neuromodulation therapy. So I will start from this point. Concurrent use of EEG and non-invasive brain stimulation techniques, in particular TMS, has received an increasing attention in the last years. One of the most interesting applications is combined EEG TMS in a closed loop approach. A closed loop approach means that the EEG recordings are um, processed online in real time to check the modulations of brain activity induced by stimulation and this information is used to dynamically adjust the stimulation settings. This approach has recently led to the concept of a brain state-dependent stimulation, for which the TMS pulses have to be delivered at uh, the right time at the defined brain states, which are measured by real-time EG, in order to maximize the effect of stimulation. So far, the protocols used for uh, Closed loop simulations mainly relies on the analysis of EEG activity, uh, mainly based on information coming from amplitude or phase of the EEG signal. Recently, there has been an interest in uh, exploiting information coming from EEG connectivity. EEG has a sufficient temporal resolution to uh, directly investigate the functional coupling between brain sources, and has been successfully used to uh, investigate brain connectivity and functional organization of the brain into networks at different time scales. In this respect, the use of real-time EG connectivity to inform TMS in a closed loop system represents a new avenue for closed loop stimulation. So we can track um, changes of not only activity but also of the connectivity between uh, uh, sources in real time. However, the estimation of uh, connectivity in real time is somehow challenging. In our group, we are investigating to what extent those techniques which have, which have been used to um, estimate connectivity in offline modes can be extended to the real time domain. Those techniques are mainly based on a sliding window which is moved in time and connectivity is estimated within every window. In these results in time courses of connectivity. And the length of this window is somehow determines the resolution with which we can obtain these time courses. So in order to track uh, fast changes of connectivity, a short window length is decided. And with this study, we essentially aim to quantify which is the minimum window length which can be used while still keeping reliable connectivity estimates. In order to answer this question, we uh, use simulations. We simulated the activity for pairs of interacting sources. So um, we used a phase coupling model to simulate the activity of these sources. We also uh, simulated the activity of uh, noisy sources as background brain activity. From the source signals, we uh, simulated the EG recordings, we also added some sensor noise, and then we went back to the source space by reconstructing the activity of the sources. From the reconstructed source activity, we estimated the phase of the signals and then phase-based connectivity matrix between these signals. There are two main approaches to the analysis for the estimation of the phase. One is the analytic representation of the signals based on the Hilbert transform, and the other one is the Fourier representation. With the former, we calculated the connectivity matrix, such as the phase locking value, the imaginary part of the phase locking value, the phase leg index, or the weighted phase leg index. With the second one, we calculated these four matrix and additional three matrix based on coherency which were originally defined in the Fourier domain, such as the magnitude of coherency, the imaginary part of coherency, and the length of coherency. For the coherency and the phase locking value, we also uh, orthogonalized signals 
for removing before calculating connectivity for removing the effects of source leakage. So this O stands for connectivity calculated on orthogonalized signals. Next, we test the obtained connectivity matrix by comparing their values to an empirical null distribution obtained by using surrogate data. If the connectivity values obtained from signals exceeded a significant a threshold value, it was considered significant. And we use this approach to uh, evaluate the performance of the different connectivity metrics for various length of the signals, which are comparable to the length of the windows, which are commonly used in dynamic connectivity analysis, so for short windows in the order of hundreds uh, of milliseconds. We also performed thousands of simulation repetitions at different level of noise. Now, I will first discuss the results that we have obtained for connectivity metrics based on the Hilbert transform. This plot shows the box plots of the distributions of the connectivity metrics as a function of the data length L, measured in number of cycles of the oscillations at the frequency of interest. For instance, in these simulations, we simulated a 10 Hz activity, so um, one cycle is equal to 100 milliseconds. You can see that for decreasing data length, there is an increasing bias, uh, which is uh, denoted by the fact that the data from the null distribution in red, data without interaction, become quite large. This means that if you use short windows, even signals which were not interacting seems as to be interacting. And therefore, at a short window length, it is difficult to recognize a true positive from the test distribution from a false positive from the null distribution. For evaluating the performance of the metrics, we use the ROC curves. The, in particular, this plot shows the area under the ROC curves for the four connectivity metrics as a function of the data length. You can see that for uh, large values of the data length, the connectivity metric show all large values of the area under the curve, but is quite uh, close to one, which means a not optimum and excellent performance of these metrics. However, for decreasing data length, this value uh, decreases toward small values, the values below 0 0.7 are often regarded to as a poor performance of the method. And if we choose a reference value, for instance, 0 0.8, which uh, is often regarded to as a value which denotes a good performance for the methods, it represents the probability that a random value chosen from the, uh, the random, a random true positive is ranked larger than a true negative. So if we choose this value, we found that if we need at least a value between four, four and seven cycles at 10 decibels, which for a 10 Hz oscillations means a value between 400 milliseconds and 700 milliseconds, while a number of cycles between five and eight at three decibels, and a value between six and eight cycles at zero decibel. Also, the value of the area that the curve represents the performance of the metrics and therefore can be used to compare the, perform to compare the performance of the different connectivity metrics. We found that while at large the length, the area was uh, for all the connectivity metrics was quite similar, which denotes a similar performance, these values become quite different at short data length. This means that at short data length, the choice of the connectivity metrics matters. For instance, we found in these simulations that PLV performed better than all the other connectivity metrics. Um, now I will show the results obtained for connectivity metrics based on the Fourier transform. And for these, the area under the curve is a function of both the data length L as for the previous case, but also as a function of the window length which is used to calculate Fourier coefficients. Because for a uh, calculating cross spectra, for instance, the Fourier coefficients have to be calculated within uh, the signals, have to be chunked into segments, and the Fourier coefficients have to be calculated within every window, and cross spectra are calculated by averaging the information from different windows.
we found a common pattern for all the connectivity metrics that we, uh, we discussed for the PLV. We found that the area under the curve increases for increasing data length and for decreasing window length, the window which is used for calculating Fourier coefficients, apart for very small values of the window, which I will comment in one minute. This is fine, but uh, this poses uh, two limitations because in real time, uh, in dynamic connectivity analysis, we are interested at short data length, and also if we decrease the window length, we lose the frequency resolution. So if I'm interested to perform the analysis with a one hertz resolution, for instance, I cannot go below 10 cycles um, at 10 hertz, for instance. 10 cycles means a one second length, which um, for the um, for W, which um, determines a frequency resolution of one hertz. So this also the reason why at very small values for the window length we have a decrease of the performance of the methods because the frequency resolution is so poor that the signal of interest is contaminated by noise by the activity which is outside the band of interest. At least this value, the corner to which the um, area that the curve started to decrease, depends on the frequency content of the signal. In our simulation, we performed, we simulated a 10 Hz activity for a 2 Hz bandwidth. So if we go below 5 cycles, so if the frequency resolution is larger than 2 Hz, so we have a contamination of noise, and so the performance of the matrix decreases. These are the counterplot for the area under the curve obtained for the, all the connectivity metrics. And so also in this case, if I choose a reference value of 0 0.8, and if, for example, I want to perform the analysis with a 2 Hz resolution, so you have to use a 5 Hz, a 5 um, cycles window length, to achieve a 0 0.8 area under the curve, I need a value between 7 and 11 cycles of data length at 10 decibel, or between 8 and 12 cycles at 3 decibel, or a value between 9 and 14 cycles at 0 decibel. So values which are larger compared to the values which were observed with, with Hilbert-based connectivity metrics. So to summarize the results that I've shown, in order to answer my question, which is the minimum window length, we found that at least a few cycles of the oscillation at the frequency of interest for the window length are required to obtain reliable estimates. For instance, we found that for the PLV, at, uh, we, to obtain a 0 0.8 area under the curve, we need at least four cycles, with a 10 Hz means 400 milliseconds. And this value represents the minimum, the, determines the intrinsic temporal resolution with which we have the estimates of time varying connectivity. Also, we found that Hilbert based metrics show a better performance than Fourier based metrics for short window. The former allowed to, uh, at least compared in terms of the area under the curve, has a similar performance than the latter's for window lengths which are one third. Or one uh, from one half to one third of those observed with Fourier-based methods. Also, and finally, the connectivity matrix, uh, an approach to dynamic connectivity analysis based with the sliding window, can also improve by adaptive algorithms, which can be efficiently implemented also for real-time analysis. So, in conclusion, we are. Uh, um, our simulations show that uh, we can uh, somehow push the resolution of connectivity metrics toward the small value which uh, allow a reliable use of EG connectivity in real-time analysis. And this can be used for a more complete characterization of the brain state, so based on not only on brain activity but also on brain connectivity, which can be used in closed-loop system for a closed-loop brain state, state triggered stimulation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, people from my group, research group in Chieti, in particular Laura Marzetti, Vittorio Pizzella, Alessio Bassi, Roberto Guidotti, which contributed to this work, and also the PI of the Connect to Brain project, Risol Moniemi, Gianluca Romani, and Ulf Zeman, and also all the members of the Connect to Brain project. And also, I would like to thank you all for the attention.